everyone. Welcome to Mind Pump. In the first half of this episode, we talk about one of the best ways to pump up your sex drive. We also talk about why you may be eating less protein than you think you are, as well as other topics. In the second half of the show, we answer four questions from our Mind Pump Media Instagram account. Questions such as, I slept like crap last night. How should I adjust my training? I have a tight muscle from heavy lifting. Should I do my next workout or should I focus on mobility? Is dairy that is not grass fed bad for you? And how can I get into the health and fitness space without going broke as I start my business? One more thing, if you enjoy the question and answer portion of these episodes and would like to get each of these questions individually in short clips, we have it for you over at our Mind Pump Clips channel right here on YouTube. All right, enjoy the show. There's one thing you can do that'll increase your sex drive, improve the quality of your sex, and give you better orgasms. It's exercise, and specifically, it's lifting weights. Studies show that lifting weights properly gives you more sex drive, gives you better sex, and improves the quality of your orgasms. You had to throw orgasms in there. Well, Doug, that's important. Doug was so so okay with your intro until you went that way. Hey, you know what? It's What's important. Wrong with orgasms, especially for women, because the studies show that uh, that women experience better and more frequent orgasms. Because this can be an issue more more commonly in women where they maybe have a, uh, trouble achieving orgasm. I don't feel like you're qualified to talk about this. Wow. <laughs> it's true. I've, I've you, have to, issue. you have to have, <laughs> you have, to have given speaking. someone an orgasm first before oh, you can talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. But tell us, tell us, Professor. No, well, the, how studies, do we do this? the, yeah. study, the studies are pretty clear. Now, what's interesting about this is studies will also show Many that visuals. too too much exercise, in particular, too much Endurance-based exercise, long distance running, cycling, overdone does the opposite. But appropriate exercise improves everything. And then strength training has been shown to do, uh, to, to be the most effective uh, you know, with all of these things. All, all kidding aside, you know that I think I, I've talked off air with you guys a little bit about this, but when um, I actually reduced the volume of training that I was doing, I noticed a difference in my sex drive. It was one of the, one of the things that I noticed the most. Like it was I, more appropriate. Yeah, yeah, it just, uh, I, I think that one of the things that we tend to do as fitness enthusiasts is we tend to overreach probably more because we like to work out. Totally. And when I had scaled back my training, uh, one of the things that was like, the, the key, aside from seeing strength go up and my joints feeling better, one of the other indicators was I also noticed like libido, sex drive. I, totally. I noticed that I was I had more desire to do that and felt better. Um, from scaling back on my training. I thought that was a really interesting thing that I, I didn't go into it with that intention, yeah. right? It wasn't like, oh, I, I want to scale back. I well, I remember, I, I mean, way back, and this became qu quite commonplace, but uh, as a trainer, I had I did not expect this to happen, but especially when I trained older people, people over the age of like, let's say 65, is they would always come to me, and this would be like, I don't know, three, four weeks into training, it's like a month, mm -hmm. and they'd say, um... So I remember one lady in particular. She was Things like, are oh. happening. Yeah, she's like, Sal, uh, so what are some of the effects of of, uh, of exercise? And I go, oh, you know, you get stronger, you feel better, you know, you burn body fat. She's like, are there any other effects? And I'm like, um, I don't know. Like, what do you mean? She goes, well, you know, like, you know, in the bedroom. And I said, I started laughing. I'm like, oh, you, you notice yeah. differences? She's like, Oh yeah, and she used the word Randy. I have much more Randy, you know. <laughs> yeah, Randy. She, wow, she's obviously older. You just dated her, huh? Randy. I know. <laughs> but um, I, that that became commonplace. I would have, and I never brought it up. I never tell clients, "Hey, you know, we're going to make you horny." Yeah, it was something that they would come to me and say that they would notice improvements on their own. That they would notice these just changes in how where, they felt. Where happy, is, hungry, and horny. Where is the uh, origin of Randy, Justin? Randy, this, I, I feel like that's something from like some you. I feel like something. you and your people would use, like my right. people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, Who are just these people? White people? <laughs> you know what I'm Mount like, Cholos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we get Randy. Yeah, where's 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 the origin, Doug, of Randy? Did you ever use Randy? Uh, I, no, I can't say I have, mm. but it's a good word, actually. It is yeah, a good word. Yeah, I like it. That's yeah. why I'm like, where, where, I mean, any any guesses or where something like that would come from? It has, Do you think it has like a, a sitcom tie or something like that? Do you think it has something just, like- Just one real thirsty guy named Randy? Oh, well, I was just going to say that's why, that. I, that's why I thought a sitcom. Like maybe it's yeah. like an old sitcom and a guy that was- <laughs> like, had like, Oh, Randy's like- <laughs> 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 Calm down, Randy. What do you got, Doug? What do you got I mean, for us? saying it probably or originated with an old Dutch word, ranten- Meaning to rave or talk foolishly. I don't understand why they put that, but to rave. 
Yeah. <laughs> there's there's Justin Raven again. Man, I thought there would be I thought there would be such a better explanation. Yeah, I for think that so. One. I, I'm looking for a better one. Yeah. yeah. Well, keep, so there's there's a, there's a few different ways that that it's speculated um, or observed, I should say, actually, because they've observed this that exercise does this. One of them is it uh, it stimulates the the sympathetic nervous system. So like dopamine, you know, serotonin, norepinephrine, all of these play a role in in sex drive. In fact, they play more of a role in sex drive than even testosterone. Now, testosterone plays a big role when it's really low, mm. but when it's when it's within range, it's the sympathetic nervous system that plays the biggest role in sex drive. And that's why some drugs, for example, have been known <clears throat> like people will use them to for sex and stuff. Well, I imagine, it. yeah, just the closer you are to balanced, you know, in all directions there, stress, hormones, everything else, like you're going to be more likely to, um, you know, feel those feelings of, of sexual drive. Yeah. There's also increased circulation everywhere. So um, circulation to the genitals is real important, obviously for erections, but also women also experience, uh, you know, what you could be said is kind of like a Almost like an erection themselves, uh, where they get blood lady flow boners. to. We used yeah. to call it that. Yeah. What? What do you La mean we? La Man, you guys don't remember oh, a long time boners. ago on the yeah. podcast. Yeah. We had like a whole yeah, yeah, yeah. hashtag lady boner. That's right. That's it was right. a thing. So how, how much? How much does strength training, or let's say a single uh, training session, improve blood flow and blood circulation? Oh wow, that's a great. You, I, now I don't. I don't know yeah. if if one. I know it will. Oh, I think it will. But I know that long term. I know the studies on long term. And I, and I wonder if it is it kind of like a bell curve, like it as you as you start to the first session already starts to increase blood flow, and then it gets better, 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 and then at one point it has to like peak out. It has to optimize, and then it probably you know, well, I know flattens there's, there's, out. Maybe like, I know there's long term adaptations because as <clears throat> muscles get bigger, you need more capillaries, more blood flow, mm -hmm. so you just get you end up building more mm -hmm. of that capacity. Mm -hmm. I know that, uh, and I imagine it's like any other system that the the more you train it, the more yeah. the more it'll adapt and more efficient it will become. Well, think about the pump, right? So when when you're working out and then you you get a pump in the muscle, um, that is blood flow. That's improved blood flow, and you don't necessarily get a pump uh, your first few workouts. In fact, one of the signs that your 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 muscle is starting to develop is when you first start to get that pump. Like you'll train somebody with really you know, let's say underdeveloped shoulders and they do an exercise and they'll feel the burn and everything. But I know like four five, six weeks later when they're like, oh my God, they're really tight. Like I know like, okay. Yeah. You know, so the capacity for blood flow, uh, I think uh, improves as well. But then there's also body image, you know, when you feel better about yourself, sex drives go up. And then I read this article on strength training in particular for women because uh, there's this interesting phenomena with women where um, they, if they feel strong and secure, then their sex drive tends to increase. So safety is a very important factor in libido in women. Mm -hmm. And because strength training uh, in particular improves feelings of strength and security, that that may be one of the other reasons why strength training in particular tends to have the, the, the best effect um, on libido. Interesting. But evolutionarily speaking, it makes sense, right? If you're unhealthy, your body's like, we're not going to have you procreate because yeah. then you're going to have to support another mouth and you're obviously barely mm. supporting yourself and not doing very well. And then when you improve your health and you know, it's, it's, it's the opposite. Your body's like, you're healthy. We need more of you go yeah. procreate. You're a lot more likely to do it with the lights on. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Another that's, benefit. That's the other one. All right, everybody. Today's giveaway is maps power lift. This is a power lifting workout program. You can get it for free if you enter to win and if you win. So here's how you enter. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode here on YouTube. Uh, leave a comment um, and then subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications, do all those things. And if we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section that you won free access to Maps Powerlift. We also have a sale going on this month. It's the At Home Holiday Bundle. It includes Maps Anywhere, Maps Suspension, Maps Prime, and the No BS Six Pack Formula, all programs that require little to no equipment so you can do them at home. Normally, if you got all of those at retail, it would cost you over $330. But right now, you can get them all bundled together for $99.99. So if you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below to get set up. All right, here comes the show. Yeah. I, I had some science to share for your science corner here, uh, although I don't have the study or any of this stuff, but I, it was something that uh, Andrew Huberman said. And I was actually talking to Andrew about this the other day. Hubes. I want to start calling him Hubes. Hubes? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's up, Hubes? That sounds Hubes. terrible. Yeah. Uh, He's riveting. 
he I, I read I read a uh, a post that he had done a few weeks back and I thought it was interesting. I think Andrew heard me either talking about it or bring it up and he says, yeah, actually I've tried that and I actually noticed a huge difference. So I thought, oh, I'll, let me let me see if I notice a difference and I have. And what, what that was was, I don't, did you guys see this post that he talked about caffeine intake in the morning? Yeah, later. Wait a little. Wait a little bit. Not a little. Like like an, like an hour and a half, two hours. Yeah, yeah. that's a lot, bro. You you know what a big deal that is? That's a big who the deal fuck does me. that? I do. <laughs> Huh? I do that. No, you don't. Yes, I do. If you get up in the morning at five o'clock in the morning, you have a pre-workout before you work out. Yeah, but I don't work out at five thirty. So when you six. get up at four o'clock, and then no, you... no, 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 no. I wake up at f like around five thirty. My workout typically doesn't start till about six forty-five, and I take my pre-workout about six fifteen. Thank you, Doug. I yeah. think he's lying. But no, okay. I'm telling. What are you How come we about? never talked about this then? Because uh, let me tell you something. Oh, I, I'm not, I didn't talk me, about it because I didn't know something. it was a, it was such a thing. But it's I don't a, take it's, it around. It's a it's a big difference. Yeah. I, I, Andrew was the one that got yeah. me to, cause I saw it and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder how much of a difference is because when, when it comes to science like this, I'm always like, oh, okay, cool. Can we feel the difference? Yeah. It's going to make that big of a difference. Do you know why? Uh, I can't, that's what I don't know. Right? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't care enough to like, yeah, get what's, to the, really deep and, what's yeah. the reasoning behind it? Yeah. So there are uh, chemicals that your body, your brain naturally produce that will wake you up and ingesting caffeine right out the gates. Oh, it doesn't it, allow that to naturally Well, yeah, occur. it influences it. So yeah. you want your body's natural wake up chemicals and stuff to, yeah. to happen. What? And then you throw caffeine on top of that later and you don't get the such crash. Effect, you right? don't get the crash. Yeah. That's what, what I really noticed is the, Interesting. the, the non, now it's difficult, right? So my, Typically, how I start my day is like yeah, probably like I, Justin is. I could get I, angry. I roll quick. out of bed and I fire the the, the coffee maker up first thing before yeah. I do anything, and it's right. like I need my cup of coffee, and I'm probably drinking it on the drive, which is yep. so that means I'm probably drinking my coffee 30 minutes or so from wake time. I'm sure. already sipping on the first cup of coffee. Maybe I push it to 45, but never yeah. much longer than that. So I've been actively waiting. To hit beyond that hour, hour and a half mark, and I notice a big difference. Yep. Huh. It's yep. it's noticeable. So I I didn't do it on I didn't do it on purpose because I didn't know about this. But then I, I read this and I said, oh, that's cool because it worked out for me. Because you normally I wake up, I read, I use the bathroom, I get my lunch prepared. I'll you know whatever if I'm going to make breakfast for Aurelius or for Jessica or whatever I'll do that. So it's usually about ninety minutes or so before I have caffeine before my. So workout. my theory is that. You know, somebody like you who's, you know, unintentionally kind of already doing it probably is not going to see a huge difference between 90 to 120. And, and yeah, because like, I'm already. Waiting. But somebody like Justin and I, who have trained themselves for so long, and probably Andrew too, I'm sure that's why he did it, who like drink their coffee first thing and consistently do that all the time, disciplining yourself one morning to kind of fight it off for an hour and a half or two. And then have that's, your. That's going to be a battle. Honestly. It was for me. It was yeah. a little bit of a battle. Um, it's you know now, that, you know, it's turned into now. Of an it's turned into a little bit of a game for me because it takes me an hour just to drive here. Yeah. So I'm already, when I hit my drive, I'm already a bit up for about a half or 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah. And so then I'm like, oh, how much further can I get in the drive? Like, can I wait? And so I keep stretching it. And I notice that. When I stretch it to- Is that safe to drive without caffeine for you? <laughs> yeah, it's actually okay. Um, and uh, But I, I, I feel a noticeable difference. So if you're somebody who's listening and you are like Justin and I and Andrew, where you consistently have coffee first thing when you wake up, uh, delaying it by an hour and a half to two hours, uh, I've noticed a, a big that's difference. Gonna mean you, that's going to mean you're going to have to wake up a little early, Justin. Yeah, forget that. Yeah, because otherwise, you're, what are you going to yeah, do? Justin, I mean, listen- I, I was skeptical of like, am I going to feel it? I felt it enough that it's worth you trying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'm just going to be like, nobody talked to me. I'm going to make it real clear. Yeah. Like, that's key to get in my car. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to, you know, put the podcast on whatever. And then just like a zombie, I'll get here. No, you're right. We'll that's the, the key is to avoid people you love until, yeah. <laughs> until, until well, so don't ask me any questions. <laughs> well, I mean, okay. So the, the reason why this is hard for some people is people often set up their morning so that they wake up at the last fucking minute before it's time to like get well, going. Well, I'm guilty of both of these. And yeah, that's I'm why it's a challenge. I'm guilty I love of sleep, man. Yeah, me too. I'm guilty of pushing the limit to how close to shower, brush my teeth, and get out the door time. That's because you guys go to bed late. If you went to bed earlier, you yeah. wouldn't do it. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm a, well, I'm a night yeah, owl. I mean, that's when all the fun happens. I agree. Uh, I morning's agree. way overrated. Yeah. Well, give it a shot. See if yeah. you know. I, I mean, I get what you're saying. 
Um, I, I have I have no option because otherwise I'm not gonna be able to work yeah. out. Well, yeah. So you know that's no. The, you've made it. You're saying. yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I think yeah. I'm gonna stop working out. I think that's what it's been easier <laughs> just to cut that out. <laughs> just cut that out. <laughs> Coffee or workout. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's Turn just, into a whole new this whole podcast. workout. This whole fitness thing. You know. Yeah. Like, I don't know. <laughs> hey, we'll do a we'll do a 90 day challenge in the reverse. Let's follow Adam <laughs> as he becomes less fit and healthy over the next 90 days. And see you know, happens. I tell you what, the, the Fun, thing Adam. that I I, I have um, honed in the most in i would say the last five years or so is the the balance of of nutrition in relation to training intensity and, and volume and consistency right like I, I was so on off for so many years of so of, like if you were off the workout diet shit yeah too. i was mm -hmm. also making the bad food That's choices super common. and it, i think it's i think it's more common than not right it i is. think it's i think more people because i i also think that uh when you're not consistent with that the, the discipline's harder because it's your the cravings oh i haven't worked out like all the all these things are compounding so it's easier to make those bad yep. choices yep. which is already by the way even when you are training difficult to do so it is mentally more difficult, but it's been my kind of way of like, hey, listen, I didn't, I, I haven't earned this, I haven't been consistent on this, so I'm not going to indulge on that that ice cream. It's gonna, it's got to sit there. I'm not going to have it, and then back on my consistent. Okay, now a lot, and just shifting that mindset of, I'm not going to allow those things to creep into my life unless I'm consistently training, and and vice versa. And I find that. It's I've been able to manage my fitness level and overall health way better in the last five years by by making that. Agreement. That's wisdom. That's wisdom that for sure setting in because uh, that's so common. You're right. It's more common than not. Where and by the way, this works in the reverse. You'll see in studies where people will start exercising and they'll naturally, typically, also start to slowly improve their diets. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I learned this as a trainer, and I often didn't touch diet for the first 30 days that I trained with someone. I, mm -hmm. I wouldn't even touch it mm -hmm. with a client. We would just start working out. No, you're right. You, they naturally just start making a little bit better yes. choices because they're exercising. And they would typically come to me and then want more advice on diet. And then we would, and, and diet is objectively more challenging anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, you work out, you show up, you're going to get a workout. Um, the diet part was more challenging. So I wouldn't touch diet for like, for like 30 days, sometimes longer. And I would wait for the person to kind of tell me that they were ready. And I'd let them know what was happening. But you would see... Uh, them naturally make different choices because they started working out. So it works in the reverse. Yeah. Can we well. expand a little bit on the conversation that we had with that lady on the live caller the other day? Um, I just think that, uh, I, I don't know if you guys you saw, I did a, um, I did a little, I had day in the life yesterday. And so mm -hmm. I did a, I did the story and I, I talked about her case. And, and I guess maybe it's weighing on me because I'm, I'm helping my sister-in-law at the same time. And it's like the identical problem. And yeah. I, I, and I think that it's, it has to be, from their perspective, one of the most frustrating places to be, right? I'm mm -hmm. a female. I'm over overweight by anywhere between 20 to 40 pounds. I am eating what I would consider good because I'm eating low calorie, 1,300 to 1,500 calories. I'm strength training three times a week, and things just aren't happening for me. Like, I don't get it. And then the, and then the, the natural, uh, you know, uh, desire to want to go burn it off by running or get on the treadmill or even restricting more or just thinking well, something's wrong with me right yeah. right it's just my body's what's going on and you'll hear that often like i don't know what happened and i don't know why my body's responding or not responding i don't know what's going on and then you look at their diet and they're consuming minimal protein like right. like the, like they're consuming just enough to not have health effects from not having I think it's it's definitely a good conversation because it was so frequent it was so many clients that I had uh similar issues with and and Courtney as well uh that I've have had to kind of talk through that process it just seems like it's not very intuitive to really seek out um you know protein heavy meals uh, and two like it's a lot easier to kind of pick and, and eat like a bird almost like it's like just smaller meals like well, less a lot like of, there's a lot of myths around what high protein is is considered like people will think oh i you know i ate some peanuts so that's protein or i had right. a yogurt right yeah that's all that's got that's, that's got protein in it. Or, or i had a slice of cheese you, or you even have one to two meals with a big protein serving yeah you eat a big chicken dinner but and that's maybe, it yeah or you have a turkey sandwich for lunch but it's like 
Okay, your Subway turkey sandwich has four ounces of right. meat on it. That's 20 grams of protein. And then your huge chicken dinner is maybe 40, 35. Well, that's, I mean, even she gave the example of like her go to is like deli meat and eggs. And it's like, you're just not even getting close to yeah, like it was the one, we one egg and, and bruschetta or whatever yeah. like that. Like, that was common. I mean, that was the same exact kind of thought process. Like, sure even with, with, oh, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. Courtney, what did was I say? Like, bruschetta? Bruschetta is the Bruschetta. bread with, yeah. the, with, oh. the, with the tomato. Oh, prosciutto is the one. Prosciutto. That, prosciutto. So, you, yeah. It's like, like it looks like a big thing that never never gets old, and you carve off of it. Is yeah, right? it's a uh, uh, It's like it's like yeah, it's like Italian bacon, I guess, kind yeah. of. Yeah, if you, if you think about that. Yeah, way. and I mean, in in her head, it's, it's like delicious. hey, those are both protein choices, but what an egg's got four to seven grams tops. She had like twelve grams of protein for breakfast. I know. It's like I remember talking to clients, and I'd say, well, you know, do you get enough protein? Oh yeah, I have. I had some cheese, you yeah. know, for a snack, yeah. and I had like, like cottage cheese, a handful or, of almonds. Yeah. And, and, you know, I had two eggs for breakfast. I'm like, you've had all day 35 grams of protein, which is actually barely enough to even keep you from noticing health effects, negative health effects, let alone the optimal amount of protein to build muscle. Well, and I think, too, because it's satiating, it, it, it you know, it may be just a foreign idea to keep going. You yeah. know, it's just like, uh, well, I'm, I, it's almost like they eat till they're satisfied. And this is something that Courtney was expressing to me. It was like, yeah, but I'm I'm done. I'm full. I'm like, yeah, but you haven't even like got close to the marks I'm trying to get you well, to. Well, that was, so that's my sister-in-law, right? Like when I was pushing her up, she's like, I, I can't eat anymore. It's just so much food. I know. It's like, you know, what's crazy is that like we, we got to this place where you're putting on all this extra weight from eating too much food, but it was the, the food choices you were making of overconsumption. And now that I've got you in this place where we're strength training, I need you mm -hmm. to hit those protein charts. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, all the stuff you hear us talk about, the, these great benefits of lifting heavy weight and building muscle mm -hmm. and speeding your metabolism, you're getting like a fraction of those benefits because you're not giving the body the, the nutrients it needs to go and build that muscle. So you're, and, and you know, imagine being in that situation. How you'll, you'll build some muscle. So minimal though. But you're, you're, it's going to be so hampered, yeah. like so, so hampered, so way more drawn out. It basically your, your weight trade, it's like you're, you're giving the plans to build the house, but there's no workers yeah. there. So it's just sitting there. Your body doesn't yeah, have a quarter one, of the or bricks. one person is building the house. Yeah. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. Like one person you is have working. five bricks. Yeah. Five today. Bricks. Yeah. <laughs> it's like <laughs> so <laughs> so it's it's so it's so common and I I can't stress that enough to of the the listener out there that if if you are in this position where you feel like you you eat good, right? And that's what's hard too is like I'm, my sister is like Man, I out of my I don't make bad I don't eat candy I don't drink sodas yeah. I don't do alcohol I don't like. By the way, this is why some people, especially women, when they add one protein shake a day, it blows yeah. their mind. No, you're right. And then they think there's something magic about, about the protein the shake. It's like no, you literally doubled your protein because you took 30 grams of protein. No, you're right. And that's what you're noticing. No, right 100 percent. You're right. And also, I know we we always talk about the the you know, going the route of whole foods always. But this is an example of where uh, I typically have to like tell a client yeah. to like include yeah. mm -hmm. a protein shake because they just can't, they can't get it. And right. so it's like, okay, in this case, you, I, and then, but we, I always tell them when I say, listen, you're, I, I want you to add a shake every single day. But the goal is eventually to get to a place where that becomes yeah. a, a real whole, a whole food meal. This is when, um, uh, amino acid supplements make a big difference as well. I had a, I had a, there was a guy uh, years ago in jujitsu, mm -hmm. he was a vegan and, um, you know, we were talking, he was like, God, I, you know, I have such a tough time recovering and my muscles hurt and this and that. And so I had him supplement with branch amino acids and it was a game changer for him. Now, the reason why it worked for him so massively is because his protein low intake protein. was so low. I mean, he could have just increased his protein intake, but it was really challenging for him because he stuck to whole natural foods. They don't want to take protein powders, which is interesting because he did take the BCAAs. <clears throat> But uh, that's when those make uh, a huge difference is because your protein intake is really low. You know, this is a type of – I'm reminded of all this. I know, I know, Doug, I think you had the NCI uh, talk y yesterday or whatever. But this is one of my favorite things about uh, Jason and their team is, you know – you can read the the science around uh, calories and and protein and building muscle, but this th it's these types of conversations and and how to apply that science to your your clientele that I think is is the difference. Maker. Well, look, you can oh, yeah. say, and this is what I would run into as a trainer. I know you guys did as well all the time. You can say high protein, 
and the person that you're talking to has a completely different concept or understanding mm -hmm. of what high protein means. So to them, oh, okay, high protein, I'll have an egg. That'll be, that's, that's a protein meal. Or I'll have, you know, a small yogurt cup or whatever. So that's got protein in it as well. It's like, okay, it's six grams of protein. Yeah. Or, you know, or I eat this cereal that says it's high protein. It's like, well, it's got five grams of protein. It's not much. So you have to really spell it out and show people, no, no, actually, you know, you, you weigh 130 pounds. I want you to get like 110 grams of protein a day. And this is what that looks like. And it would always blow their mind. Like, I, I don't, I, I can't eat that much. It's like, well, try it and see what happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See what happens to your results. Yeah. Yeah. Um, by the way, speaking of NCI, they're doing a giveaway. Doug, you pull it up there on the screen. Yes. So they're going to give away an all expense paid trip to Arizona in April where they're going to be able to hang out with us. And what they're going to get is they're going to get flown out. They're going to get all expenses paid. They get a VIP ticket. So they get to have a great seat and they get to learn from the world's best nutrition, fitness, marketing, sales, and more. You can have Alex Hormozzi speaking, Tom and Lisa Bilyeu, um, uh, and you know many other people. And then we'll be there as well. So you'll attend. You'll get all the stuff paid for, covered, and then it's uh, and you get a course. You get a course included with this. And in and this is going to be the winner will be announced December nineteenth. And what's the website? What is that? Mind Pump. Yes, NCI Mindpump .com forward slash CC two three. So go on there, enter, and then see uh, if you win. I don't think you and I are speaking at this event. I think what we're doing is they, they set up, this is like going to be like this private fireside. Chat yeah. And we're going to hang out. Yeah. yeah I think that's what we, we decided we're going to do this time. Anyway, I, I want to get, we cool. got to talk about um, the, what was, what's the girl's name? Brittany Griner. Brittany Griner. I knew you were going to bring this up. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so here's what happened. Right? Totally so, fair trade, by the way. She gets, this is this. We'll get there. So she gets thrown in jail in Russia because she had a vape pen with, I think, some some THC residue on it, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and that's highly legal over there. Thrown in jail. I don't remember what the sentence was. It was a ridiculous sentence. And we negotiated her release by releasing the world's most notorious illegal arms dealer. Totally fair. What's his name? But yeah. maybe Doug can find it. Uh, the WNBA can now continue. Yeah. So here's why I'm annoyed with this. <laughs> Not that I think she should be in jail. I think it's silly to throw someone in jail for possession. It's a victimless crime. If you hurt somebody or you do something stupid or whatever, I get that. But if you're just Bro, how many how many people in our in our own country that's are it. in prison over that, stupid, dumb stuff? That's still. It. Yeah. And but none of them playing the WNBA. None of them are minority, yes. you know, lesbian basketball yeah. players that got politicized. And so nobody gives a shit about the thousands and thousands of people in our jails who are thrown in jail for We're releasing pedophiles over, you know, people with, uh, uh, you know, these minor offenses. Yeah, for and drugs. Their, their, their possession. And yet this girl does this, it gets politicized, and we release one of the most notorious evil people ever. Yeah. In order to get her back. Did you, did you get the name? Yeah, of his name is Victor Bout. He's also known as the Merchant of Death. There, there was a movie that had <laughs> okay, him. So yeah, you, so it was uh, Nicolas Cage is called Lord of War. That's it. was it. based off of this guy. Yeah. Okay, put your tinfoil hats on. We got to get you, some new you, negotiations. I didn't take it there. off, bro. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> so keep your tinfoil hats on yeah. and, and tell me this. Do you think someone, because this is uh, Putin was involved in this, right? Putin yeah, was of one, course. Okay, say, well, so yeah, do, you, do, you, do you think that Putin is this much of a mastermind that- one of my buddy gets one of my buddies are in prison in the US yeah. and I go, I ah, don't worry about it. We'll we'll get you out. You know, I'll 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 seize an opportunity. I don't and even you, think it's a mastermind. Know, it's okay, just you bargaining know, chips. Yep. You know how 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 politics are over in the US and the things that move the needle in the news. And you go, you just are waiting, you're waiting to seize that opportunity of and you and you target, like you go after like I don't think these, they, I don't she think was they there, purpose. he found an opportunity. Yes. It, it was like it, it was like somebody just like gifted him this. That's so you think it's more like asset. you think it's more like yeah. it was she, her it was her guy caught up. Uh huh. It was her vape pen. She she admitted it. She no, I know, but <clears throat> but I mean like uh to 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 push the that that type of a sentence and to go like I feel like so it, he, so the, he had to be he, he had to know that he was going to do that so in the laws, order to get the laws my there the questions more on our motivation yes that's my question so the laws there are very very um strict and harsh when it comes to possession of certain uh, substances where where you know like marijuana so i think she got caught she's got you know some notoriety it's a wnba basketball player 
And at, at this time, Russia and the U.S. don't necessarily have the best relationship. So I definitely think Putin seized upon it. But I don't think he seized upon it for the trade. I think he seized upon it to show his people and the world that just because you're a famous American, you're not above the law. That's what I think he did. Yeah. And then our politicians were the ones to seize the opportunity to go, oh, we got this basketball player chick who's a minority and whatever. This looks we gotta bad go, on us. Yeah, we got to go save her. Yeah. Let's make it happen, and it looks good for us to do. That's what I think. Because I think it could have been a random American. Like, if if some other American got thrown in jail, oh, they're, nobody they're, would give a shit. No, no way. They no, wouldn't care. They would be rotting in prison right now. Nobody cares. So I think it was our politicians were like, oh, this is going to work for us politically because, look, we saved this girl, and we'll do whatever it takes. And then, of course, Putin's like, cool, let's – you're coming to the bargaining table saying you'll do whatever it takes. Well, this is what I want. I want this dude, you know, to get released. Ridiculous. I don't know. I got a lot of questions. It's yeah. It's silly to me. I don't, again, I don't think she should be in jail. I think that's terrible. Yeah, of course not. But man, we just gave away somebody that was responsible for some terrible shit. I mean, this guy was dealing with illegal arms, like uh, right, to, for to some the max. Way. And many of these arms were, you know, could, could have been implicated in terrorist attacks and, well, these are just things that just look bad. You know, the optics of it overall. And I mean, <laughs> I hate to bring up how we left Afghanistan, but that is just we not, left a lot of, yeah. That was a disaster. Crazy. So speaking of of of, of just to kind of hammer this home, uh, women's sports. Uh, did you guys hear about the women's soccer team? How they're going to get money from the men's soccer team? They negotiated what's called like a revenue share. Well, I mean, it, it. The NBA has been playing for the WNBA for a long time. Yeah, it's a losing. It's a losing. By the way, I got all kinds of uh, followers from that. Uh, there was a, a viral video of I don't even know the 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 lady's name. That's a WNBA player that was being interviewed, and she was talking about where you know we're not asking for the same pay as you know LeBron James or that we just want. A, a revenue share of the the profits of all the stuff that's being sold off of our name and stuff, but the the thing that's so crazy and ridiculous. I made some comment about you know zero of zero is still zero, right? Like it's like you're not the WNBA doesn't profit anything. It's completely propped up yep. by the NBA pumping money yep. into it so that it can actually even operate. Well, could, if it was a legitimate business that had to run itself, it would be out of business and there would be no profits to share. So this idea of give us a share, a higher share of these, pro there are no profits. It's not profitable. If it was profitable, then I'm sure- Nobody watches. They would get paid more. It makes me, it makes me upset because all the- People who are like, but they deserve, and it's not equal, and all the you know the you know they label themselves fem feminists or whatever. If they all just went to the games, they wouldn't need to take money from the NBA. Right. If mm -hmm. all you people who are super upset, it's always somebody too who's fighting for it. It doesn't fucking watch or could even name five. Players. I watched a podcast. That's the irony. Of I watched this. a podcast where this girl was all super pissed off, and the dude's like, "All right, name three players." She couldn't. Mm -hmm. And he's like, "Oh, so you're so upset, but you've never been to a game. You don't pay for tickets. You don't buy their jerseys." Like you're full of shit. I mean, this this is the point that I, I made with Katrina. Like we were sitting around. I think it was it was during COVID, and we were talking about all the. It, remember when that big old ordeal happened with the girls not getting like the oh, same the kind of equipment? The, yeah, yeah, the men did. And also that, and so Katrina and I, first time we ever had even discussed something like this, and she was kind of taking the defense of the girls in this situation. And I said, I said, can you name me five WNBA players? And I mean, how many games have you watched this year? Like if you really want to support them yeah. and you really want them to have these th these things, then one of the best ways you can do that is buy a jersey, buy some tickets, put watch the watch the channel so they get they can get more advertising. Like, I mean, you guys are all screaming and yelling and protesting and making this isn't fair, it's not equal. It's like, but then you don't watch a game, yep. you don't buy a jersey. Yep. You know what I'm saying? It's you, not up to everybody else. You got to be the one yeah, initiating it's it. Just, it's it's and just, by the way to talk about that doesn't mean like you're anti woman either. It's like it's business. It's it's that simple. It's, no, you should get paid what you earn, literally in the marketplace, and that's all. And it's just a fact. And, and again, all the people were mad if they went and bought tickets, they'd be making a lot of money, but they're not. They just want to appear to care. And tell people how angry they are. So now the women's soccer team is sharing revenue T with the men's? Taking money from the men's team, yeah. Interesting. So that they could, you know. I mean, it's the same thing, like I said, they're doing in the very NBA. Although the women's soccer team, I think, is a, a more, far more well-known than, than the WNBA. Yeah, yeah. They're way, the, the women's soccer yeah. team is is way more popular yeah. than, I think, WNBA. Yeah, so they actually do Actually, I don't know that as a fact. I just assume. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's Well, true. I know more of their players. It was definitely, yeah, back in the day when we were watching, it was very popular. 
Yeah. So right. any, anyway, anyway, I got some. Uh, I found this uh, this page. Uh, I know we normally do this at the end, but I'll do it now. I found this page that is really actually Justin. We could get lost in this. <laughs> That's the name of it. This page. It's on Facebook. I don't know if they have an Instagram page. I wrote it down. It's called the Rabbit Hole. Yeah. Oh God! This sounds like a page. Oh, that you, dude. That you too. It's all these crazy stories and conspiracies, and a lot of them are true. And I watched one, and I. And this is true, by the way. So is it any? Is there an underscore yeah, or space? It's just the the rabbit hole. Oh, yeah, okay, on see, Facebook. It, okay, it, it, yeah, it ties a lot of funny stuff in there too, like some mythical creatures and things. So oh. it's like you know, it's it does kind of cover the full gamut of uh, bro. I'll get lost on this. Okay, so this is not. There's not. They're not on Instagram. This is only Facebook. Facebook. Okay. So there's there's so this is true. I looked this up. Did you guys have you guys heard of the German Christmas story? about Krampus. You ever hear about Krampus? No, I saw that there's like a movie for it. I don't really know its origin. This is an actual story. By the way, back in the day, lots of children's songs and stories were designed to get children to behave. Well, they do have an Instagram too. We're fucked up. Yeah. Like the stories back then, like oh. the kids, hey kids, if you don't do this, so <laughs> Krampus. Yeah, yeah. So Krampus, Grandma's going to eat you. So this is what Krampus does. If you're a bad boy or girl, Krampus shows up throws you in his bag and kidnaps you, takes you back to his lair and tortures you and eats you. And they used to tell kids. <laughs> <laughs> they used to wow. tell kids this no. story. Wow. Yeah, dude. I don't this want why, to be on the naughty list. This is why kids are so weak nowadays. We tell them, we don't tell them stories like this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You got to set them straight. Yeah, I was, well, I was actually talking to, who was I talking to my mom about stuff like this? And uh, she goes, and we were talking about like, man, they used to say oh. terrible shit to kids. And she goes, well, yeah, you have nine kids. You don't have a dishwasher. You don't have a washing machine. You got to do everything by hand. She's like, you did everything you could to keep your kids in line. You know, right. and one of them was well, it, it's you a, act up or Krampus is going to kill. You know, Krampus is going to show up and eat you. It's interesting to think about that because what is it the uh, uh, the fairy tales the Graham um, the Grim Grim the Grim yeah. yeah. So the, all of them had like some kind of reason and moral in there, right? So it's like they don't want kids just wandering aimlessly into the woods by themselves, you know, because <laughs> so they, they're going to get enticed by this candy house and then get eaten by they some- They get fattened up. Yeah, they get, get fattened up by some witch <laughs> and, and eat them. You know, it's, I don't know. There's always like something there that uh, they're trying to tell it, but it's really, everything was based on scare the shit out of them. I mean, Disney did this a lot too, like with mm. all of its earlier Bro, movies. Yeah. Speaking of Disney, Disney, did you know Disney? So you ever hear the conspiracy theories like Disney's like run by like these pedophile groups and all this other shit? It's like conspiracies around this. Oh, did you ever watch? Yeah, there's an old Mickey Mouse, old black and white. Mickey Is that Mouse the one that, uh, that Jackie I, shared this morning? I, I, I did. I shared it, it to you. Oh, guys. you shared it. Did you it? see yeah. it? No, I didn't see it. So it's old Mickey Mouse cartoon, black and white, and he's on a conveyor belt making Swiss cheese. And do you know how he's punching yeah. the holes in the cheese? Yeah, because there's just regular cheese unhold, right? Yeah, but. Uh, according, uh, so Mickey just decides, hey, I'm going to like add a hole. Kaboom. Yeah. With his uh, little with his Mickey. mouse boner. <laughs> yeah, dude. Really? And, and yeah. You can see it in the cartoon. It's um, insane. I'm it's like, not pretend. Did you go to our, uh, oh, I see it. Okay. Yeah. The actual cartoon shows Mickey banging the cheese each time it goes by <laughs> to turn it into Swiss cheese. <laughs> and I mean, there's a, if you could, there's like another video that. Oh, like, well, he actually has a little. He yeah, has a woody. He's, he's got a little chubby yeah. dude. Oh, it's no, not. I mean, he has like it's an. It's, it's clear. It's, it's very clear it's that clear. it's a, a. This is real. Yeah. Yeah. Come yeah. on. No, I'm telling you. That's but it's really old. So I mean, back then, I feel like it probably like got through somehow, and people didn't, uh, you know, get all upset about it initially, right? I like know. I don't know. Maybe it just well, because so this turned this, a blind eye to it or this something. This totally corroborates with the. Like you've seen the like oh the the top, the cover of the VHS for yeah Little yeah. Mermaid has yeah, got yeah. you know you know you know boners on it and the priest is getting all excited and like you look at his pants and yeah, yeah or there's all these I mean I always okay Simba so hits the so the, I you know, I think that's less subliminal a, stuff I think that's less like you know, Disney is an organization and more of the Disney has up animators yes there's tens of thousands of employees that work there yeah. and I'm sure they they're they, fucking with each other yeah yeah they, they have right, like crude humor and stuff like that and they're like hey let's make this look like a penis they'll never know you know yeah. or they'll know way later type of so I think that's that, what I used to think. Or they can't prove it, right? Like, prove to me I was driving that's, a penis. That's what I used to think until yeah. I saw these old-ass cartoons where Mickey's, you know, banging cheese. Now yeah. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> what the hell I mean, that's on? very obvious, right? So that's, Yeah, that's not an accident. That's not like, hey, we'll slip this by. That's like, it's in your face. Yeah. It's not yeah. real. 
It's not, not real? real. No, oh. it was created on a site called Beta Board. I was Damn just, it! I was Man. just gonna say. Did I was we like, get? Did we get bamboozled? Yeah. yeah so Thank you for was, fact checking. They basically took Steamboat Willie and a bunch of older stuff, and they took pieces of that, and they combined wow. it to make it look real. Oh. That was a good cut. Too man, Damn. it looked real I'm as, at as hell. Man, after post. you after after you saw that Steph Curry thing, you got to think that everything potentially I know. is fake, bro. This is where we are now, right? That's like, how there's it. just so many ways to doctor I don't care. videos. I still think Disney satanic. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't Mickey. It was I, Dicky. I yeah. can see. <laughs> yeah, I can <laughs> see it. I fell for that one for sure. Dicky the mouse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Damn. I, again, I think it's hey, how fucked up is that that we're disappointed that's fake. We should be relieved. We should be relieved. All right. Well, here's. That. Here's some real shit from back in the day. This is real shit. So do you guys know De Beers? Who De Beers is? They own the yeah. diamond mine. They're the one that started the the whole why we should get diamonds for weddings and yeah. stuff. Like yeah, and you know, if you, you and you know how crazy that like how they are with controlling the markets yeah. and all yeah, that stuff. Yeah. They're, they're Did be- you guys know in the 1950s, their miners and I don't remember where their mines are or in other countries or whatever. Do you know where Doug? In Africa, somewhere. I somewhere, think. right? Yeah. They would every time workers would leave to go home, they would X-ray them. So they'd get x-rayed every time they left. Oh, to see if they stole anything? They had any diamonds wow. inside their bodies. That, that's healthy. They're yeah. already in a coal mine. Just x-ray their shit in the out mine, of and then they got to x-ray Every them. single day, every oh. time they'd leave. What a hustle, dude. I Yikes. know, right? Such crazy. a crazy hustle. All right, here's something else that's interesting. I found this this morning. This is real. I looked this up. This is kind of, this is actually real messed up. Do you guys know there's a surgeon? Let me see if I can find his name. There's this surgeon that uh, he, he went to jail, a British surgeon. Okay, uh, Simon Bromhall. So he was a surgeon at the Queen Hospital in Birmingham, England. He got in trouble because he would, whenever he'd operate on someone, <laughs> he would carve his initials into their internal organs. <laughs> what? That's gangster. Little Picasso. He's kind of an artist. There, huh? I mean, yeah. if you're a surgeon, you're doing like serious work like bro, that, or like Zorro. It's kind of understandable. Sh- how messed up is that? So he would. How did how did someone find that out? That's a good question. That is a good question. I, I mean, they were doing like, like just having because he would, he's probably thinking they'll never find out. Yeah. Yeah. Like, how are they going to find out? I don't know. Maybe someone got an autopsy or something. Yeah, enough people. And they're like, what is this crazy signature hey, and how, you see hey, on all, the, all these lungs? And how stupid is he <laughs> yeah. to put his initials? <laughs> yeah, that's not hard to find to out who that was. I mean, if you're going to do it, though, that's a, if you're going to do it, that's how do you find that out? That's, that's a good question. Yeah. Somebody had to like, it doesn't him out. say here. Uh, in this, in when this what, what era? When was this? You said? Uh, this was. Let me find out. 2014. Oh, this is recent. I thought. Yeah, for some reason, dude. I heard you say 50. So yeah, dude. Really... He got in. Uh, he took a scalpel to the abdominal of his patient. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, he, he used an argon beam. This is a, a tool used to control bleeding from organs. So it basically, it kind of like a, a what's like a the word? laser? Yeah, and he would write his initials on somebody's. Like organs. cauterize it in there. Yeah, dude. Wow. That's messed up, huh? Oh, that's crazy. I yeah, know. that's I, crazy. I know, crazy stuff. Anyway, uh, here's an interesting study. Adam, you shared this with me on Instagram. There was a somebody talking about birth control. Oh, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. I wanted you to talk about and it. And its effects on muscle strength and muscle. So hmm. um, so it wasn't. this wasn't new to me because I had read this uh, before, but I did think it was interesting enough to bring on the podcast. So birth control has been shown in studies to uh, significantly reduce... Uh, muscle growth uh, from exercise and adaptations. So it's got a negative, you know, adaptation effect on the body. Hmm. So women who are working out, lifting weights, trying to build their bodies, who are also on birth control are getting less results now, is because this, of the hormones. Is this directly connected to what's going on from as, from an estrogen level? Like what's the hormonal the, level. Yeah. Or just in general. Yep. In general. So the, the uh. hormones themselves are, uh, you know, are, are, are reducing the adaptation process hmm. in the woman. So she's not building as much muscle. Pretty, I mean, interesting. I don't know if it's necessarily like, I don't know how many women would stop taking birth control for that. Cause yeah. you know, okay, but now you build more muscle, but now you accidentally got pregnant. But, uh, but well, I just think it's, but it's I don't good, think women it's are good, told It's this. good information because I, when I grew up, I think most of my girlfriends that were taking birth control just assumed it was benign. I don't think anybody right. really, you're right. That to me, they were the, never told potential. No, it was negative. already mar- yeah, it was always marketed that way. Yeah, I mean, it was just it was all around safe sex in that direction, and there's no like, hey, you know, no ramifications. Yeah, for no it. one's talking about the 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 potential repercussions of that. Like, I mean, Katrina's the only only woman I've ever dated or met in my life that actually has never taken birth control before. Oh wow. Yeah, she's never she never she never. And she's did. jacked. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's what, so what it says here in the study, and this is speculation, the diminished lean mass gain may be related to the effects of 
uh, birth control on anabolic and catabolic hormone levels or the androgenicity of progestin that may bind to androgen receptors and inhibit its, its function. So in other words, progestin type uh, hormones uh, in birth control may actually bind to the androgen receptors blocking the effects of the androgen receptor so that testosterone can't necessarily Now, does it. the study go into if this is a, um, like only when they're, while they're taking it, or does this actually potentially affect them even post taking it? What do you mean? Like if like, they stop? So like, yeah, so they stop. So like uh, if, it, if it, it, it potentially hinders building muscle, not potentially, it does hinder building muscle. So does that, is that still true post taking it or is it only while they're taking it are they getting not these? aware of any long term you know muscle building negatives although i would speculate that once you go off and everything goes back and regulates back to whatever normal that you probably go back to where you were before although i will say this long term hormone use um i know they they advertise long term hormone use is like oh you go off and you just go back to where you were before I don't know if that's necessarily the case, especially the longer you've been on right. something. I'm sure it would depend on how long that period of time was. I, I would imagine, right? Because yeah. there's going to be some adaptations that are going to occur. Um, and the longer you're doing something, the more... Like I have friends, again, this is all speculation, but I have friends who were on birth control for a long time, went off and had a lot of challenges getting pregnant. You know, Isn't, that, like, isn't that kind of normal? Um, I, I, they I've say heard cases where you, it takes people a year or two years before they self-regulate and get back. Well, I, I, from what my understanding, I think you're supposed to be able to be okay within six months. And I've heard stories where women like, I, I forgot one pill and I got pregnant yeah. right away. Right. So I think it depends. There's a lot of different factors, but, but you're right. I don't think women are necessarily aware of the, all of the potential risks, uh, like depression, uh, mental effects. And then, you know. I mean, I think building. that was really uh, Dr. Jolene Brighton's motivation, right? Yes. Because mm -hmm. there just really wasn't a lot of information around all all the adverse effects of of taking that because it just wasn't promoted to women. Yeah, it's or, interesting. She's the only one I can think of that's really a big voice out there of, uh, you know, explaining long-term birth control use and maybe, you know, to consider um, ways to, you know, get off of birth control and see what that looks like. Yeah, I think that's where her popularity comes from is that she was one of the, you know, real original authors to write a whole book, I mean, Beyond the Pill, right? I think that's the name of the uh -huh. book, Doug, mm -hmm. is that right? That sounds right. Beyond yeah. the Pill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you guys hear about Chris Hemsworth? I had to look this up just to so I don't misrepresent what's going on. Did you hear about what, what's Thor? going on? Thor? What's, what's up with Thor? He did a genetic test and he found that he has two copies of the APOE4 gene. Um, so those are both connected to an increased risk of Alzheimer's or mm. it, they are connected to increase. So if you have one of them, you get an increase. If you have two, which is rare, you definitely have a huge increase. And so um, I guess he's like, this freaked him out. So he's like predisposed. To very Alzheimer's. much so. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. That because he's got both of these, and so he's like, I think what he's talking about is like he's he's looking at things he can do to prevent this and you know stop this because the odds now are significantly higher because he found these genes. So you know, I think that's going to hmm. be one of the the biggest breakthroughs that we're going to have, or I shouldn't say breakthroughs, maybe the one of the. Uh, most positive or greatest like evolution uh, evolutions of of science when it comes to preventative like i think that and i, I heard the all-in guys talking last year about some of the the tests that you can take now yeah that, and that will predict like cancer and so many things like so yeah. early like i really think that we're going to get better and better at that which is going to be awesome right because hopefully and i know mm. Yeah, you, know, you know, the the studies show that people still don't change their behaviors. I mean, I know I would. I know if I could take a test right now that said, "Hey Adam, you're on pace to have X, Y, or Z." Uh, it would it would definitely shape. So what would you guys do from what you know now if you found that you had this genetic risk for Alzheimer's? What would you guys well, end up doing? If there's appropriate steps nutritionally, that's probably where I would start. I think first. Max Lugavere would become yeah, my exactly. best friend. Yeah, I'd go ketogenic. Yeah. I, I'd eat a, a yeah, mostly I ketogenic diet. I'd really look at controlling insulin. I would start now, fun. yeah, to really try to uh, mm -hmm. make it a, a ritual and something that's not like foreign to totally. me. Totally. Now, the challenge with this is when you find these increased risks, it's not a guarantee. And some people, I forgot who, I think it was Angelina Jolie. She had the, maybe you can look this up, Doug, at the BRAC, B-R-A-C, What's that? Gene, which really increases your risk of breast cancer. Mm. She did elective double mastectomy. 
Oh, so because right. she has yeah. this this increased risk, she went and just removed just her breasts completely. Proactively did it. Yeah. So and the risk, you know, the the challenge was that is my God, what would you know, will people overreact? Um, like how much of an increased risk? What does this look like? You know? Yeah. How much know. can you can you reduce the risk by changing your lifestyle? So that would be that's the thing. Like you could cause undue stress on someone by like imagine if you did a test and they're like, oh well, you know, Adam. It There's says thirteen percent. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, you have a gene. I would want to test for like everything, you know. That's oh, really? At that point, yeah, because uh, I don't know, dude. Because yes, I would. I would start like future tripping and thinking about like way too many things that would bring me anxiety versus just like being that's a, present. That's a, that's a really interesting thought and discussion because you know, I, quickly I would respond. Oh, I would want to know. I would want to know everything. But maybe you're right. Maybe. You know, maybe telling me that I have a 7% chance of getting something would have more adverse effects than it would have positive effects because it's right. already kind of low, but it's enough of a chance that I'd be like, oh shit, maybe I should make some some lifestyle change. But now I'm thinking about it all the time or stressing out when I do something that I know isn't beneficial. Yeah, I, I just don't huh. like to be negatively motivated anymore. Uh, no. That used to be a big uh, draw for me, like a fuel source of like, you know, like I, whatever pain, I'm going to use that as fuel and like bar barrel through. And like, I don't know, I've been well, trying to think. And also percentages are interesting, right? So let's say you get a, there's a gene that they, it's the BR, it's the BRCA gene that I was in. And I'll get to that in a second, but it's like, okay, Adam, you have a 40% increased risk of, um, you know, heart disease or something like that. Right. So now you're like really freaking out. But if you look at the numbers, 40%, of whatever the number is, not saying heart disease, but let's pick another one that's maybe not so prevalent. That 40% increase means it's not a big number because your your rate was 2% to begin with. So now you're, you know, 2.5% or 3%. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I think that would matter. That makes a big difference. Yeah, but I think it will free, we got to be careful because people can get freaked out. And, the, and uh, you know, what role does stress play? Yeah, I, I'm going you know to stick yeah, exactly. with that. I would want to know. I think I would want to know these things, including what you just said right there. Like 40% of 2% is virtually nothing, but a 40% chance of it happening to me, hmm. okay, which means it's almost 50-50 it could right. happen to me. I would want to know that. And then, and, and whatever that is, so I could be, you know, training my body and or mind and, and adjusting my nutrition to put me in the most, you know, optimal position to handle or work through something Well, so like with that. the BRCA1 hmm. and 2 gene, it's actually pretty, this one's pretty terrible. 13%, I didn't know this, by the way, 13% of women in the general population will develop breast cancer sometime during their lives. I didn't know that. 13%? That's, that's more high. than one out of 10. By contrast... 55 to 72 percent of women who inherit the BRCA1 variant, and 45 to 69 percent of women who inherit the BRCA2 variant will develop breast cancer by 70 to 80 years of age. Wow, so that's a big risk jump. So I can see why maybe she wanted to yeah. do get a double uh, mastectomy. Hmm. I don't know, man. That's crazy. I would want to know too, but. I, you know, I wonder how much it would, like the stress would play a role. And then you would like, anytime you felt something, you'd be like, oh shit, I got that gene. Yeah. You know, what if oh, I think for someone like you, it'd be almost a bad thing. Cause I can worry a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Just any, if you have any hypochondriac tendencies, I, I would think that I would caution uh, to throw the kitchen sink of variables of everything that could go wrong at you. And, yeah. and just because it would spin a lot of people out that are prone to that, I would think. But I, I, that's a tough one. Cause I, I could see your point too, of like, well, if I at least just knew, okay, like potentially down the road, I could be susceptible to this type of disease, this one. And if I just make better habits and, and go in this direction, at least epigenetically, I'm not going to express, you know, that. Well, yeah. especially if you're potentially doing something that is like really not helping in that direction and you didn't know any better, right? Like, you had no idea, like, let's just say, like, you know, saturated, uh, the overconsumption of calories and saturated fats is going to, you know, promote the growth of this or accelerate the potential of that. And it's like, I mean, I love saturated fat, but not enough to where it's like, wow, if it's putting me at that much higher risk, then maybe I, I do choose different types of foods. There's other ways for me to enjoy food and cut yeah. back in a specific you know category, right? You know, what's challenging too about this is because genes are really complicated. So what's the relationship to the other genes? And also do these genes contribute to behaviors that also increase the risk of certain things? So for example, let's say you have a gene 
that increases your risk of Alzheimer's. But what that gene actually does is it increases your sensitivity to like light and uh, poor sleep. So maybe it's the poor sleep or maybe it increases your appetite for sugar or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that also contributes like when you're looking at the group of people that, you know, and maybe not so clear like the BRCA one, that's a pretty big percentage, but maybe looking at other ones, it's like, okay, now let's look within that group of the 80% of the people that didn't get cancer. What did they do in their lifestyle? And what do these people do in their lifestyle? Because mm -hmm. then maybe if I do those things, what percentage of them end up getting this particular disease? Oh, none or mm -hmm. 1%. Well, okay. That's not that big of a thing. So I, we don't necessarily know enough about some genes we do, mm -hmm. but a lot of other stuff we don't necessarily know enough about to make these big decisions, which is why I think uh, this is why insurance companies, health insurance companies don't test for a lot of these things. They'll test for like a few that are very clear, but other ones they're very careful because yeah. it doesn't necessarily mean you know what you might do you think. know that uh brad pitt can't remember people's faces oh yeah i forgot what that's called yeah that i heard Does that it, the like other at day. All? It he's true. got a weird uh disorder it's, yeah it's like uh yeah I, I forget what it's called but um when you're you know because as a baby that's like one of the biggest things in the development sure. process is sure. being able to recognize faces and like distinguish all the different characteristics and uh, apparently like it's called prosop P pagnosia prosopagnosia yeah, thing, huh? face blindness face blindness there it is yeah so he can't like distinguish in a crowd like who is who what? which is weird yeah and it's like so it's probably like nobody believed him either because it, know, it would probably be like i see you guys and then until i hear your voice i don't recognize you so, oh that's justin okay what's up man yeah isn't that weird that's really it, weird it, yeah, yeah. It, i know it's hard to like process like there's another disorder maybe Doug but it, i mean his vision is okay yeah yeah but so it's how a, his brain perceives yes, it. Yeah. Yes. Wild. Yeah. There's a part of the, there's That's also wild. this one disorder that you, you'll recognize someone, but you are 100% believe that it's not that person and rather it's an imposter. So I'll see like Doug and I'll be like, God damn, that guy looks just like Doug. It's not Doug, but it looks just like him. And you believe it so strongly. And that's an actual disorder. That, huh. that some people have. Oh, that's right. Weird <laughs> shit, right? Yeah. Anyway, so we're supposed to talk about uh, another one of our sponsors, LMNT. I got to say this. So obviously Jessica right now is breastfeeding and boy, does LMNT play, it really contributes to her milk production. Yeah. And I remember yeah. when we had Aurelius that uh, this is when we first started working with uh, LMNT, they told us that there were lots of women who were nursing who were saying, oh, this makes a big difference. It increases milk production. It's was it sodium. Rob Wolf that brought that up? He uh, did. I remembered that and was like, I've never even thought of that, but it totally makes logical sense as well. It totally does. You know, Katrina, Katrina did it. It was a big difference. You could see a big difference. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I couldn't see. I mean, kind of I could see. But <laughs> <laughs> hey, really, it was her Why do you keep me, giving me yeah, element yeah. tea? <laughs> Pretty full <Drink> today. <laughs> Drink up a little bit. She's like, it doesn't work after the baby, Adam. After I'm done, oh, not breastfeeding oh, anymore. Maybe. <laughs> No, Maybe if we no. rub it on, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just put the powder on. No, it was, uh, she also had these things that she, I think they were like, I think there was like, they make these cookies or whatever, crackers. Lactation cookies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah that would like the, those two. There's also, those um, two things oh, that's what the cold beer too, like beer does it, uh, the the wheat and beer does it. There's some, there, there's these compounds, this class of, of compounds called galactagogues. Maybe Doug can look them up, uh, but these. It sounds like something out of Transformers. <laughs> some of galactagogues. The they, I think I'm saying it right. They increase milk production. However, one of the side effects is it gives, it can give the baby gas. Uh, so, uh, you know, so we try, that. there's these tea, this tea called mother's milk and we were trying it, but then uh, the baby was having trouble. I think she so tried it, that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To Fenugreek is one of them. And then there's, oh, Galactica. I did say it right. Synthetic yeah. or plant molecules used to induce, maintain and increase milk uh, production. Yeah. There's uh, like goat's rue. There's another one, go through fenugreek, and I can't remember. I mean, I know you're early right now, but what um, what are or are there any challenges you guys are are having right now? Like, is there anything that she's having? Like, latching has been fine. Sleeping seems to be been, doing yeah, good. Been good. I mean, it seems like you guys have had a much easier the, process. The bigger challenge is really just juggling the the two the two kiddos because uh, we have a two year old, and you know, two year olds are very demanding, and then an infant, which is even more demanding. So that could be a little challenging because Aurelius is trying to figure out how, like, he likes to like he'll 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 try to jump on Jessica or you know grab while she's holding the baby. Yeah. And so she's you know now she tells him when I'm holding the baby you have to sit on your butt. 
So he'll just, you know, he'll just sit down and, and not Dude, jump as much. I'm or, smiling, laughing inside because you just reminded me about like my favorite new sport to watch. <laughs> it's called juggling. Um, it, it, it's a, a combat juggling. Combat so they juggle, juggle with pins and then they like hit each other and they're like juggling. What? I swear to God, this is a real thing. What? You watch the video. Some, it's got to be in Russia. Yeah. Uh, it's got to be somewhere totally obscure. So, okay, so is it more than one or is it like one-on-one? -on -one? Me and you are fighting or doing something? Yeah, I think it's like it's like teams, and, okay. and they're, they're you have three of these bowling pin things that they normally juggle, right? And they're kind of like running around trying to knock the other guy's pins as oh. they're juggling. It's, it's hilariously, like, weird. Like, why? Like, who thought, like... No, I'm juggling, you know, I'm just imagining some it was kind the, of mime, like getting messed with. And then he's just like, whoosh. it was the jugglers association. trying to figure out how to like become more popular. Like, hey, you know, we haven't been popular for decades. Nobody really cares about us. What do we, yeah. let's create <laughs> we a do juggling we extreme. Yeah. That's, that's not as, that's not as cool as what the, the, the fights that they're doing now. They tie each other. Or yeah. Right? No, 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 in mean, phone booths. The phone booth fights like are pretty that epic. That's <laughs> funny. Dude. That's hilarious. Those are epic. Or in the car. Have you seen the one in the car? Yeah. Yeah, or like one or the one where on their platforms and then they jump down off a platform and you know attack somebody. That's a good time. I Those like the great. one where they're like uh, they're like they're tied to each other and they have to they have to fight. Oh, each arm other. wrestling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You either win by arm wrestling or knocking the guy out. Yeah. You know which one I watched that I thought would be way more cool than it was. It actually looked. I couldn't watch it. It was terrible. It was a gang. It was like a group combat. So it was like four, it was like five against five. Yeah. And you think like in the movies, like this is going to be freaking rad, but here's what actually happens in real life. Somebody gets knocked out and then it quickly becomes five on four, then five on three, then five on two. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, Oh, I don't want to watch this. Yeah. It's like two guys against five dudes. Yeah. Are getting, yeah. getting this is, jumped. That's it. And then you think about it. Like the times that you've ever, I don't know if you guys have ever been in a, in a, in a big group fight. You're like, Oh yeah, that's exactly oh, how group it works fights out. Are the worst. Yeah. Get out of there. Check this out. We work with a company called Pathwater. It is the first certified refillable and 100% recyclable bottled water uh, that you'll find anywhere. So it's good water. comes in sturdy aluminum containers that you can reuse over and over again. And they're also fully recyclable. And right now, you can actually design your own bottles. You can actually go to drinkpath.com, use the code MINDPUMP, get 10% off, and then design your own bottles. Go check them out. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from that guy, KC. How should you cha your training change if you slept like absolute crap the night before? Well, because you said absolute crap, so mm, there's like my not sleep, just crap, it's yeah. absolute. There's like there's there's my sleep wasn't as good, and then there's like it was terrible. You're probably better off skipping your workout or um, going through and just doing very light movement to alleviate uh, like stress, inflammation, just kind of move through it. But you're probably okay, and you might be better off. Uh, skipping the workout because training on top of the stress of terrible sleep. So training itself is a stress on the body. If your body's already under a lot of stress from, because one night of really, really bad sleep places a tremendous amount of stress on the body. So then you're going to exercise. Not only are you not going to build muscle and burn body fat, but what you're going to do is you're going to amplify the stress signal, making your body want to hold on to more body fat, make your body want to get rid of more muscle and increase your risk of things like craving. So if it's that bad, you're probably better off uh, skipping the workout. I would venture to say, like, your average person doesn't really realize there's a way to train uh, recuperatively. So you go in and you don't have to necessarily um, lift in, in such a way where it's still going to be demanding and intense. And, you know, I think some people know how to kind of lower that intensity, but there's a way to really kind of uh, promote more recovery, more and facilitate just blood circulating and and um, to, to be able to go through the movement so that way it actually brings the overall stress of your body down. This is such a hard one to answer because I'm, I'm for sure know that each of us would answer different to, uh, you know, five different people with the same thing, right? Same, there's, there's five people, all five of them had terrible sleep the night before, but given a little bit more information about that client, I could foresee you giving advice different, at least a handful of different pieces of advice. For example, um, if I have a client who is extremely inconsistent with their training already, and they also got a bad night's sleep and we were just catching momentum in our training, uh, 
I, I care more about the consistency of them staying in their routine than I care. Are we going to make any progress in this workout because of your lack of sleep last night? And then also, am I, are you the type of client that is, is looking for excuses all the time, not, not to work out and, you know, and how, how, often does this happen is this something that just so happened is like just because if this was like you normally get great sleep and then this is like a one-off like take the day off like mm -hmm. it never happens it was a really rough night or go your route go to the gym still keep your routine but then do something more recuperative do that mobility do stretching you mm -hmm. know go for a long walk for an hour instead maybe not do something so high intensity so you know it's hard to just give a blanket uh, well, answer can, to this. I, I can tell you what I used to do mm. with clients. Um, cause I, at some point I made the switch where, and I realized that I, I was doing a good job when clients switched from calling me to cancel because they had bad sleep mm. or because they felt uh, like their, their shoulder hurt or their back hurt. So they call me and say, Oh, I can't make today's workout. My back hurts or I got poor sleep. And then there was a switch at one point, And this is when I knew I was doing a good job when people call me and say, Hey, I don't have a workout scheduled to, with you today, but my back feels stiff. Can I come see you? Or, hey, I got really bad sleep last night. I feel terrible. Can I come see you? And what I would do is I wouldn't work them out. <clears throat> I would do stretching. I'd do myofascial release. We'd go on a walk outside. Literally, they'd show up and I'd say, okay, we're going to do 15 minute walk outside, especially if it was sunny. Then I'd bring them inside. I would do some stretching with them. I'd do myofascial release, which is just a fancy term for some kind of deep tissue work, um, uh, you know, to the limits of my expertise. Um, and then we would do kind of like full range of motion, low intensity movement so that they felt better, yeah. S not so that they felt like they got a, a workout and then they would seek me out for this. And then it would do what you said, Adam, it would maintain their consistency because mm -hmm. with a lot of people missing a workout, re it, they start to get, it, it's hard for them to stay consistent afterwards. Yeah. It's like they, you know, once the ball is rolling, what do they say? Right. You got to keep it rolling. Yeah. So yeah, but that's when they would be with me. Now, when I'm if somebody's doing this on their own, you got to be really careful because, and then people don't do a good job of doing that when they go to the gym. They, then, they only know how to work out. And then know? what what would you say or how would you address? Um, you know, I've referenced Doctor Andy Galpin a few times on when he talked about this a long time ago about the the benefits of actually. Uh, you know, putting our bodies through these kind yeah. of like stressful, like we're, that's not ideal. It's yeah. not optimal for building muscle. It's not like optimal the for burning fat. Effect of it, yeah. yeah, but then the the benefits of you pushing through a a stressful time like that to teach your body to be able to overcome a situation like that, so that it has a little bit of value too. So. Yeah, I think it's more of a mental benefit, right? Because you you learn how to kind of be tough and um, not you know be able to work through certain things. Um, and I think there's value to that for sure, especially when you're training athletes, high level athletes, or of course, law enforcement or military where, yeah, we're not here making you more fit. I'm just making it well, tough. Yeah. And I think that's just going to naturally occur. It's not like something you need to go seek out. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm not going to sleep and you know, I'm going to intentionally do that. Yeah. So that way I'm going to get this kind of, uh, strength benefit as a result. I think it's just, yeah, it's a matter of being able to deal with what life throws at you mm -hmm. and be strong in general mentally with that, but also be able to know that you get, you can bounce back. Yeah. But I will say this, n nothing negatively impacts my workouts. No single thing negatively impacts my workouts as much as poor sleep. Poor sleep destroys my progress, completely crushes it. I can get away with a bad diet for a little while before I start to see really, really big negative impacts. And I can get away with training suboptimally for a while. But like if I sleep really bad after a few nights, my workouts are not just worthless, they become damaging is what I noticed with myself. So this is so because this person said absolute crap and not just like, oh, it wasn't the best. Right. That's when I'd say, okay, if it's absolute yeah. crap, like you were slept a few hours yeah. and that's it. Go you, get some sleep. That's yes, exactly. Recipe. Next question is from Hello. It's Ivy. If a muscle is tight, is it better to continue to train it with weight or focus on mobility exercises? You know, what's funny about this is this question, mm. and I know why, where it's coming from. There's a myth that a tight muscle it is a disadvantage. Well, it becomes tighter right. yeah. because you strength train it. Uh, right, that that a tight muscle is a strong muscle, and a, and a weak muscle is a loose muscle. In fact, uh, oftentimes it's the opposite. Oftentimes, a tight muscle is a weak muscle, and the reason why it's tight is because your CNS has identified that 
you know, outside of a particular range of motion, there's a high risk of injury. So it tightens the muscle up. It tells the muscle to stay tight all the time. Full range of motion, appropriate strength training actually helps to loosen that up. Like if you feel, um, you know, really tight in your hamstrings, really light, stiff legged deadlifts would actually loosen them up where you actually challenge the stretch a little bit with some weight. Now, mobility exercises are phenomenal here, but there's again, another myth with mobility that mobility doesn't involve strengthening. Right. Real mobility exercises. It is strength. Is strengthening. Yeah. It's not static stretching. Static stretching can be a part of a mobility routine, but a mobility exercise itself, you're connecting to the muscle as you're moving through these ranges of motion and you're trying to build strength in new ranges yeah. of motion. That's what improves yeah. mobility. Usually uh, you're working a little bit more on end range strength. So a little bit further beyond maybe uh, what you would be mm -hmm. working out with weights if if that's the case. But yeah, that's, that's one big different. Uh, feature from that in static stretching is it's just not passive. It's very active. You're very much um, trying to to support and by by activating your your muscles and, and getting them fired up so that way it has that kind of a res accurate response to protect the joint. Um, but yeah, like it in terms of like muscles being tight, it's an advantage as well for performance. So it's not like, so the, the question itself for me is a little bit flawed. If, if they're referring to uh, a muscle that is uh, limiting you from function and, and daily things that uh, you should be capable of, it's, it's really, it's a protective response, right? And that's something that you can work through yep. with mobility specific exercises to get your body more familiarized uh, with those ranges. Yeah. I think, I think somebody letting us know what muscle is tight would give us more insight on how exactly we would address it in the, the workout mm -hmm. to your point right there, Justin, if it's tight and it's limiting me from doing another exercise really well, I might actually stretch it and to get it to kind of relax so I can then train the, uh, the right. uh, opposing exercise that I'm trying to work through. If it's a, a tight thing, like let's say tight hips or something like that, I would probably do something like mobility work first uh, in that area, in the hips, and then do a strength training yeah. exercise mm -hmm. uh, afterwards. And so that's how I would address a, a tight muscle, but it would depend on exactly where this person is tight and for what reason, and then what we're trying to accomplish on the exact prescription of what I would do. So here's, so this, I actually learned that what I'm about to say, I learned this from a physical therapist I work with, and she was one of the best when it came to correctional exercise. And I'll give you a great example. So somebody's like, oh, my neck and my traps are tight. And you'd think the last possible thing we should do are trap exercises because you're already super tight there. But what was super effective with this particular, with, with this particular case was I would work on, and again, I learned this from a, a, from somebody who's really good. I would work on the, the reason why they're tight in the first place. And with tight traps and neck, usually you're looking at poor, you're looking at weakness in the mid back. You're looking at weakness in the muscles that drop the shoulder blades. You're looking at some shoulder mobility issues. Anchored properly. But before I would do that, I would actually do very light, super full range of motion shrugs with dumbbells where they come up, squeeze, and then let the traps drop all the way down, rest, and then come up. Not heavy, but just moving the muscle through full range of motion because what it would actually do is it would actually tell the CNS to chill out a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then I would go and do exercises for the muscles that you know, we're being protected in the first place with the tight trap. So, so again, there's a, there's a myth that training a muscle makes it tight. That's not the case. A tight, like I'll give you an ex other example. If my body believed that my eight, my elbow was unstable, which is very rare, but let's just say it did. And it's like, oh my God, your elbow's super unstable. My bicep may just be super tight. So it keeps my elbow in this position. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, oh my God, my bicep's so tight. Well, it's, it's not necessarily the bicep that's the issue. It's the fact that my body thinks that it's unstable outside mm -hmm. of this range of motion. So it's trying to keep it in the shortened range of motion. So what would fix this tight bicep is to t let my body know we're actually safe moving outside right. that range of motion. And sometimes it might be a past injury yeah. that then you compensate for, or maybe it's just the way that you've always limited yourself range of motion wise. It, it just tells the body that uh, we're just uncertain about going a little bit further to that. So we want to protect you so the injury doesn't occur. Next question is from LAPD. Does dairy need to be avoided if it isn't grass-fed? Oh, great question. Not necessarily. So first off, mm -hmm. so long as it's you can tolerate it, because dairy's one of the top foods that causes uh, gastro issues for people. So, what is the percentage of our population now? Do you know? 
Like uh, uh, like how many people? Are- it's got to be, uh, I want to say 10%. It depends on who you're talking to, by the way. Like Mediterranean, you're going to have a higher percentage than Northern Europe. Everybody in the Midwest somehow. I mean, the reason unaffected. why I'm asking that, though, is, those, is to make the point that 90% of you would probably be fine. You, I think you know if you have a daily intolerance. It's, it says uh, 68% of the world's population has lactose malabsorption. Yes, but that's because how big of a population is China, for example. And I know that Asian populations have a higher percentage of lactose. Like if you're Northern European, yeah. you're probably fine. Probably uh, okay. And you talked about the Midwest. The Midwest was like heavily populated yeah. by Northern Europeans. Exactly. Um, like Africans tend to have high lactose issues, except for a certain region of Africa where- Yeah, like the one the, tribe, I remember it's like the Maasai very heavily. Yeah. They drink the hell out of it. Yeah, Northern no. Europeans have a lower rate at 18 to 26%. Yeah, so, so, it's so, so that's lactose. But then there's also dairy intolerance. But anyway, my point with this is if you have, if you can tolerate dairy, it doesn't cause intolerances. You're fine. Dairy is one of the healthiest foods on the planet. Yeah. It's actually one of the healthiest foods on the planet. It's very nutrient dense. Uh, it's got proteins and fats that are very beneficial. What's the difference between grass fed dairy and traditional dairy? The fats. By the way, this is where you'll see a difference in, in beef that's grass fed versus beef that's not grass fed. You don't find it in the protein. The proteins are the same. It's in the fats. Mm. And the fats in grass-fed dairy tend to be higher in CLA, which is a, a, a type of fatty acid that's got some health benefits. And there's certain nutrients that are a little bit higher. If you have a lot of milk, you drink a lot of milk and you eat a lot of cheese, I mean, this is like a big staple in your diet, then you probably, I would say, it makes sense over you know years and years and years, it makes sense to go for grass-fed. If you have occasional dairy, it's not really like this huge, you know, big staple in your diet, then it's not going to make that that big of a difference. And I think that's true for like grass fed beef. I too. mean, would you, I would make the case that it, if, if you can afford to go that route and you, to your point, eat a lot of, of dairy that it would, it would behoove you to, to move in that direction. It's not going, it's definitely not going to hurt you by going grass fed. Yeah. And if anything, there's, there's one, cause okay. So the real difference in the, the, the fatty acid profile is the, uh, it, there's a lot more in the grass fed, higher amount, higher concentrate of Omega threes versus there's six and some nines. Omega threes. There's more, and then higher CLA. CLA okay, is the other one. Right, and so you have something that is, you know, you com- if you go non grass fed, it's potentially uh, higher inflammatory markers. Correct. Yes, it's, and if it's three, then you're that. That's it's not a huge difference. So here's the thing: it's not this massive difference, but it's enough of a difference to where if you have a lot, I, I know people, by the way who will drink like half a gallon of milk a day. Yeah, it's depending on your consumption. Yeah, right? now the it makes volume, a difference. Yeah, it, how much of that is included in your everyday diet and also too, the overall calories. Like, So it, it just reminds me of like going organic versus uh you know having just regular vegetables it's 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 it, in terms of like um if you check the boxes you're going to check the calorie box first yeah right? and then after that we're going to like try and refine well, and get like, more quality it's like grass-fed beef i i eat on average a pound to two pounds of beef most days for me it makes a lot of sense to go grass-fed now if you have beef once a week you know, twice a week, eh, it's not gonna make that huge of a difference, that mm-hmm. big of a difference. But if you eat a lot of it, it makes a big difference. Same thing with eggs. You know, I eat eight to 10 eggs every single day. Pasture raised makes a difference. But if you eat like, you know, an egg here and there, it's not gonna make that that big of a difference. Same thing with, uh, with dairy, grass fed versus non grass fed. If you have a ton of dairy, then it makes sense. But again, it doesn't affect the, the proteins. It affects the fats. Why am I saying this? Because you'll see whey protein that's grass-fed versus traditional whey protein. Um, now, un- unless you're looking at the like carbon footprint and all that stuff and it's better for the cows, that's different. Mm. But in terms of a nutrient standpoint, whey, 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 it's just, it doesn't make a difference. Mm-hmm. Next question is from Justin Lifts Weights. He does. <laughs> How do they know that? Yes, we do. All us Justins. I really enjoy learning and teaching about health, strength, fitness, and nutrition. I already make good money though. So how would someone step into that space without going broke while waiting <laughs> to make enough money to support, support oneself and one's family? I like how you position this. Exactly. Question. Yeah, I like how you put this question. I really love helping people and training yeah. clients and stuff like that, but I also don't like Listen, being broke. I don't want to be what, broke. What, 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 <laughs> you know, it, there, there's definitely some space. I feel like we did a good job of like <laughs> presenting. Well, I'm glad, yeah, I'm glad you at least like a little reserve. It's the truth. Look, there's some, there's some markets where... It's it's going to be a lot harder to make money. Like you want to be an artist. 
uh, you probably should have another job as a backup because yeah. it's going to be really hard. Uh, now, some artists make a ton of money. I mean, but see, most it's, don't, it's right? the it's the I mean typical eighty twenty rule. Right, eighty percent of the people are making twenty percent of the money. Twenty percent of the people make eighty percent of the money in the in the space, and so yeah, but that the, number is bigger or smaller depending on the market. Like you know, computer engineers, bankers, investment bankers, you know, fitness. You know, what do you mean? What, what do you well, say? if you're if you work in investment banking and you don't make that potential, yeah, you don't make that much money for that space. You're still going to make more money than like, Oh, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Cause oh yeah. I high. mean, yeah, no, or if we're comparing this to engineers and financial oh, advisors yeah. and stuff like that, <laughs> yeah. like, well, if you do that, then uh, even if you're in the 20%, you may only make as much as the, the bottom percent of the yes, financial advisors. Exactly. So <laughs> to that point, yeah. but I mean, there still is potential. Obviously, the the three of us had lots of success in fitness even before Mind Pump. We we were successful financially, and so, I mean, I I believe this. It it really is a question of like how passionate are you about this? Like if you if you really love it yeah. and 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 it keeps you up at night and yeah. it's something that you do even when, like well, it doesn't I, you know matter what, what we have to say at that point. That's you, how you have to kind of look you know at when yes. I you know when I knew that that this was going to be the the path for me was when when hours after I was on the uh, off the clock I was still hanging around in the gym talking about yes. our job and stuff like yes. that and that it's the and it's the hours and days and weeks and months and years of that time that I spent that compounded and and gave me the advantage in this in this space so if you find yourself and I think this is true in any career path if you find something like that that you you love so much that mm -hmm. even if you're not getting paid you're going down the rabbit hole of getting you're better do it anyway. You're going to be good yeah. and you're going to make money eventually. It just might take a while in fitness. It's just, it's a space that uh, I use art because I think it's similar in the sense that, you know, you don't go into fitness thinking I'm going to make a lot of money. You go into it because you're like, I love this. And this is what I have to do. It is not a space you should go into and say, well, I kind of like fitness, but it's a great way to make money because it's not, it's a challenging way to make money. It's not, un it's different than other spaces. Like I said, investment bankers, I'm sure there's passionate people who are super passionate about investment banking, but you know, there's a lot of people who do it because it's a cool job. It's all right. But Hey man, it's a great way to make a, a living. And I only work nine to five. Paychecks are consistent. Yeah. So it, it, you have to have a, a tremendous passion for fitness to be able to build it into a career. Cause it's challenging. It's challenging to work with clients. You have a high fail rate. It's not a huge money maker out the gates. It takes a lot of creativity, a lot of hard work. And if you're passionate about it, none of that matters. If you're so if you're so passionate about it that that doesn't matter, then you know that it's for you. Okay. Otherwise, okay. You know. So let's let's pretend this is one of us. Um, we make really good money in the let's say the financial sector. Yeah. Uh, but you're also passionate about fitness. Maybe we don't really love the financial sector, mm. sector but we obviously love the paychecks and and but we want to move in that direction. How would you guys? I, I imagine, especially with the way you can make money in fitness today, I doubt that I would cut my job cold turkey as a financial advisor or whatever and go right into training. I think there's a way that you could to, to mitigate ease. the risk a bit, like really yeah. like think That's tough, about though, your right? angle. I know it's, it's, I would, it's, I would have to like really ponder like what my strategy is. I mean, is, is it really, I mean, it. I mean, is it really you suckers did that for this business? Totally True. different. Totally different. Why? What do you mean? But the, we just ready, set, go. Yeah. I mean, we were already working on it. He's asking. I didn't ask anybody. Yeah. And, go. All, and we also had decades of experience in fitness so that we could talk about it. It wasn't like we came into it and we're like, oh, we're, we don't know how to do this. No, I know. But that's my point, though, is like you not only did you have all the confidence, experience and knowledge in this space, we still eased into this. We yeah. did. We still waited a long time before you even cut the ties of your other stuff. And yeah, we, we did. But uh, but imagine becoming a trainer for the first time and just doing, you know, three four hours a day and like, I'm going to turn this into my career, but yeah, you also I mean, have a full-time job. I mean, job. you're right. You're so, and I know the point you're making here is that, and I, I mean, I stand by the, the, I love the, the 10,000 hour, you know, thing. It's like, it, it takes, it takes damn near that to get really, really good at something. And, and especially in training, if you're going to make good money enough to where you'd walk away being a financial advisor, you're going to have to get pretty close to that many hours into, and if you're only doing, Two hour, I mean, do the math. It's going to take you 40 years I think if before you're really, you put that 10,000 hours in. I think if you're really, really passionate and you really want to do this, then you save up enough money to give yourself a buffer and say, okay, for the next six months, 
I can earn minimal money and I'll survive. And I'm going to give it myself six months to do well. And then I think the easiest path, not easy, easiest path would be to work in a big box gym and move up uh, the, the ladder there. Because I think if you have, if you're motivated, you do good with sales, you work your ass off, you could become a six figure employee within a year working yeah. in a big box gym. Now, if you go off and you never trained people before and you're like, I'm gonna go do this on my own and I'm gonna try and build a six figure business and you've never done it before, it's gonna be way harder. Yeah. Uh, you know, just doing it like that. But I think the big box avenue, because a lot of big box companies, mm. UFC gyms and, you know, even 24 Fitness still, like you could go get a job there and perform. And within a year, there'll be opportunities to get into management and then, you know, make more money and, is, and do the whole thing. Yeah, this is where I, I think I've changed my think my thought process on this a bit. Because, you know, most of the gurus out there that are all about, um, you know, leading with your passion is to, oh, just quit your job and then go all in, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and, uh, I, I just caution that and it, knowing, so we talked to, uh, Mark Randolph, right. And, and his whole thing was like to be able to test it at, yeah. uh, it, with minimal risk as possible, you know, li minimal investment. Does your idea, uh, is your idea solid? Is it, is it something that you could actually build? And is this, um, wanted by consumers what you get all this data like right away like, yeah go test it right away uh you know for for this person i would almost apply something similar in terms of like well go um you know offer your services to friends family whatever like try and get like a maybe a part-time job get your feet wet is this even something or do you just have this sort of glorified no, I love, vision in your I mind I love that piece of advice Justin so I, I think I'm more on your page with how I would approach this um I mean it actually is very similar to my path like when I first got into fitness I was still going to school the, the main goal was to finish my kinesiology degree and I actually told the guy at 24 Hour Fitness, like, no, I only want to work part time. That's all I'm going to work. Now, what sold me on giving it a year was that literally every paycheck was bigger. Mm -hmm. every, at every two week mark I got paid, it was a little bit bigger. And, and I could see the trajectory. I, could, I had enough of a test like, wow, this is me applying myself you know, half of my, yeah. my commitment and time towards this. I'm, I've got kind of a knack for it. I'm loving it. I'm spending my downtime thinking about it and learning about it. Maybe there's something here for me. And then it was, okay, I'm going to give it one year of my life and, and, and pour everything I got into it and let's see where it takes. I me. did the same mm -hmm. thing, but you know, so I think this, uh, here's something that's in common with that is that we went to work for a large company that already had the game plan and kind of had the road set up for you. All you had to do was show up and perform. Yeah. They got, they gave you the leads. They had the systems. They had the agreements. You had a but, ready. I mean, that's what this person's asking. So. Right. So what I'm saying is, what I'm saying to them is, if this is what you want to do, either A, work in a big box gym where that, that road is clear. Oh, I 100% agree. Or B, oh, I 100 agree or, or agree B work under a mentor who's very successful, who's willing to mentor you, which is very difficult to find. Or C, if you do want to try and do this on your own, Find a company that trains it. Like NCI does this. NCI is a certification company you work with, but they also have a business side that specifically works with trainers and coaches and teaches them this is how you build your business. Because otherwise it's hard. I'm telling you right now, it's really, yeah. really all the fitness passion in the world is great. And it'll help you because you'll weather the storm or help you weather the but storm. You have to sustain it. Half but, the, man, there's half, so much stuff. Half you don't the people know. in our NCI group that I talk to are exactly this person. Yeah. Yeah. They have a career somewhere else yep. that they're successful in, but they have a passion for fitness and they're trying to make that leap. And NCI is an incredible they uh, for making that. But I agree with you. Uh, I, and I think ju that's Justin's point too. This person's saying, like, how would I do it not to go broke? Yeah. A way you could go broke is by by trying to build a business outside of a large facility on that is that would be yeah, that's a unless you already maybe had like a large social media presence may if you need some way to generate a lot of leads and a lot of practice yeah, yeah. right now and uh, if you haven't drummed up a lot of leads going to work for a a franchise or a, a big company is one of the best ways for you to get those reps yeah, that but you're I, about. yeah i would argue even then that'd be a mistake because they haven't built their expertise yet 
uh, yeah. in, in their craft. So like, you know, going the big box route really helps you to re- refine the craft of it. And really oh, you're understand. saying if they had just a following yes. on, okay. Yeah. No, I don't disagree. Look, with I that. did both. So I had trainers work for me in gyms and big box gyms. And then I had trainers rent space for me in my wellness facility. And a lot of the trainers that worked for me in the wellness facility were also were people who didn't have, it's not like they transferred their business over. They didn't have clients. And they came to me and said, hey, I'm thinking about building a personal training business. And I'm going to tell you right now, it was exponentially. And these these are people that I trained and develop because I own the facility. So it was in my best interest to make sure they were successful. Otherwise, they couldn't pay me rent. So I would be very involved with helping them build their business, at least for the first 90 days. Exponentially more challenging than when I, when a big box gym, I could take a trainer, I could get you five clients in the next two hours. Like, no problem. Look at the people working on the floor. I'll get you five clients, no problem. When you when you came to my facility, boy, was it hard. It was way more challenging. So well, yeah, it's uh, the, that's lead, the path. It's right the there. lead thing. I'm saying. I mean, you get uh, a big box gym on average is seeing fifteen hundred to two thousand workouts a day. You work in a little private studio like yours. What'd you get? Nobody. Twenty people. Yeah. Maybe, and they maybe. already have trainers. Right. Right. Like so, you're getting like no leads. So a huge difference. Totally. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to MindPumpFree.com and check out our guides. We have free guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of weak points and and areas that I struggled with developing for a a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 